The growing trend of giving children one-to-one -one devices such as Chromebooks, laptops, virtual reality headsets, and iPads at school is increasing the amount of screen time our children experience daily. Screen use and the electromagnetic radiation emitted from these devices has been associated with a myriad of health risks, including myopia, retinal damage, sleeplessness, addiction, and behavioral issues, to name a few. The use of screens in schools also brings with it information sharing and privacy issues associated with online curricula, online assessments, and student data collection. In this presentation, we'll learn from five experts in various aspects of this new field of public health and information sharing. We'll touch on behavioral issues, addiction risks, electromagnetic radiation health effects, privacy threats, and eye damage, as well as action steps parents and others concerned with these issues can take. It is time to begin discussing best practice and safety guidelines for these devices in schools. We hope you'll learn something new and will be motivated to help promote safety guidelines in your own schools and states. I'm Christine Zips, co-sponsor of the event tonight. And it's, it's, it's hard to believe that a mere 71 days ago, Heather and I met halfway between her place and mine and brainstormed this idea. We are so grateful to have assembled this wonderful powerhouse team of experts who are going to share with, with you their information tonight and, and you're open to sharing your experiences and your questions and hope that that will be great. Thank you all very much for being here. And tonight, I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker, Dr. Victoria Dunkley. Welcome, and we're really delighted to have you with us. And Victoria is an integrative child psychiatrist who specializes in children with complex or treatment-resistant mental health conditions. In her book, Reset Your Child's Brain, she outlines how everyday uses of interactive screen devices can easily overstimulate a child's nervous system, triggering a variety of behavioral, learning, and mental health symptoms. So please welcome Dr. Dunkley. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. So as she, as she mentioned, I am a child psychiatrist. Uh, about five years ago, I also got board certified in integrative medicine. And integrative practitioners look at a patient in a holistic way. So we look at hormones and micronutrient levels, diet, exercise, everything like that. But in spite of having all those additional tools that I can work with, I, I still find that addressing screen time is by far and away my most effective intervention. So today I'm gonna to go over some of the trends that are going on with children today, um, the physiological impacts and some of the mental health concerns that are associated with that, the benefits of restricting screen time, and then some uh, recommendations. So currently there's quite a few disturbing trends that are on the rise in children. There's a huge increase in psychiatric disorders, bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety disorders, ADHD, tics, Tourette syndrome, autism, they're all on the rise. Um, alongside this, there's been a huge increase in psychotropic medication prescribing, particularly the stimulants, which are used for attention issues, as well as antipsychotics, which are used for everything from ticks to aggression to mood problems to autism, a whole host of things. And those medications are very effective, but they have significant side effects, some of which are permanent. So it's, it's concerning that those are being used so much. There's also a lot of medical conditions on the rise that we used to only see in middle-aged adults. And now we're seeing um, a lot of obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes in kids, as well as back pain, neck pain, things that we you know, never used to see in kids. There's also a big increase in disability filings for mental health and neurological issues, and an increase in the gender achievement gap. So both boys and girls, their reading scores are falling off the curve, but boys are falling twice as fast. And reading is one of the 
best indicators for success in life, so that is concerning. So meanwhile, we have a huge increase in daily screen time for kids. You know, grade school kids are averaging four to six hours a day. Older kids are averaging up to 10 hours a day. Um, at the same time, we're seeing an earlier exposure at earlier ages. And then there's also a huge increase in screen time at, in school in terms of doing homework on the computer, educational technology, um, smart boards, the list goes on. So if we know that there's all these disturbing trends going on, as well as a huge increase in screen time, the natural question is, is there a link? Well, we actually know already that there's um, known associations with screen time and all these different things. I'm not going to go into all of them, but you can see this is very similar to the trends I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> so then the question becomes, if we know that it's linked to all these different disorders. Why isn't the public more aware? Why aren't doctors more aware? Why aren't educators more aware? And telling parents about them. And the reason is because there's a lot of myths that are perpetuated in our society uh, for various financial and political reasons. So the first myth is that content matters, that you know, if, as long as it's educational, it's OK. But the truth is that it, total screen time is a much better indicator of if, if there's going to be problematic use. So it's really the medium, not the message. Um, I'll skip through some of these. Another myth is that computer skills need to be taught early for kids to survive in today's world. But most schools are really overemphasizing computer skills um, and often to um, the detriment of other other subjects, including reading and math, basic subjects like that, but also in terms of PE, music, and art. And kids actually learn computer skills very easily, so we really don't need to overemphasize them. <laughs> As we can see, because our, our tech person here is 13 years old. <laughs> so another myth is that educational technology is revolutionizing the way kids learn and that can save schools money. But in fact, it's quite expensive. Um, and we know that ed educational technology is, is at best neutral. That's what all of the studies show. And it probably is harmful. So there's studies showing that um, devices in the classroom actually impair performance. And this has been shown in kids and adults, including at MIT. Um, another, there was another international study that showed that schools with the most computer use had the lowest standardized testing scores. And um, the learning habit study showed that kids that had less than 30 minutes a day of screen time had the highest GPAs. It also showed, in that same study, it also showed that um, kids with the highest GPAs also spent more time with their parents and did more chores. <laughs> <laughs> parents like to hear that part. <laughs> there's also a myth that there's you know, all this new incredible software that can help kids learn how to read or solve other learning disabilities. But in fact, we know that e-reading or reading from a screen, learning how to read from a screen, actually hinders literacy development. And for all of us, for kids and adults, it actually slows us down, and it impairs um, reading comprehension. There's another myth that devices make students more efficient. Uh, but we know that taking notes by hand is superior to taking notes with a laptop. Many studies have shown that over and over again. Um, and it's superior in terms of recalling the information, integrating the material, and test performance. So it's just important to remember that the nature of screen technology is it, itself is really at odds with what the brain needs to thrive. So in terms of how, the screen, how interactive screen time affects the brain, there's numerous reactions. But one way to look at it is that it really acts like a stressor and induces a fight or flight reaction. So every time a child picks up a device and interacts with a device, their nervous system gets more revved up in um, a higher state of arousal. And there's numerous ways this happens. One is that the reward pathways get activated. Dopamine, which is the feel-good chemical, gets released. And those pathways get activated pretty intensely and eventually will become desensitized, which is why kids need more and more stimulation to pay attention. There's a lot of intense sensory stimulation with screens. There's vivid colors. There's rapid movement, scrolling. Um, 
all of these things are, you know, the brain must process, and it takes a big load on the, onto the brain. The light from the screen is very, it's bright, and there's a lot of blue and white tones with screen light that mimics the sky and tells the brain it's time to be alert and awake. And what happens with that is that the, brain, the body clock gets desynchronized. Um, melatonin, which is the sleep signal that helps us go to sleep, with normally triggered by darkness, gets suppressed. And it doesn't take very much screen time, maybe even like 10 minutes in the evening for that to be suppressed. So not only does that disrupt the body clock, it also, having low melatonin increases inflammation, it's associated with cancer and depression and some other things. Multitasking, we know particularly with teens, um, they're notorious for multitasking when they're doing their homework and everything else, but you know, they'll be Googling terms, um, Skyping, texting, they're on social media all at the same time, and, and then complaining it takes them three hours to get their homework done. <laughs> And we know actually multitasking actually impairs cognition. The interactivity itself is arousing, it's stimulating, so that also causes stress response. And then electromagnetic radiation, which one of our other speakers will go into in more detail, but uh, there's a, a lot of overlap between the effects of screen time itself and radiation. So, and t so if we have all these physiological reactions going on, how do those translate into symptoms? So this is what I call electronic screen syndrome, and I really just named it to avoid misdiagnosis of other issues. So basically, all of these mechanisms um, overstimulate the nervous system. The brain goes into a state of chronic stress, and eventually what happens with, with all kinds of chronic stress is that the blood shifts from the front part of the brain to the deeper parts of the brain to the more primitive parts of the brain, and the frontal lobe starts to suffer. So if we look at what the frontal lobe does, it controls everything from executive functioning, so getting things done, focus, planning, prioritizing, to emotional regulation, impulse control, creative expression, and even empathy. So all the things that make us human. So you can see if the frontal lobe becomes impaired, any or all of these roles are also impaired. Which means that a child that is revved up and um, exhibiting signs of electronic screen syndrome can look, they can present in a variety of different ways, but one very typical way is that the child will um, have a dysregulated mood. So they'll be very irritable, having meltdowns, um, rages even, especially in teenagers. Or they'll be very tearful, easily frustrated. Cognitively, they tend to have very poor focus, they're forgetful, they're you know, forgetting to turn their homework in even when, when, even when they do it. Um, and then behaviorally, they'll tend to be very oppositional, defiant, poor social skills, they might be you know, a poor sport on the playground, poor eye contact, that kind of thing. And it's all because they're operating from a more primitive part of the brain. So this is just a reminder that <laughs> Adults, you know, all of us are addicted to our devices. Um, but it's important that, you know, parents, including teachers, provide good role models. So this is just a list, I'm not going to go into all of these, but of how electronic screen syndrome can mimic or exacerbate virtually any psychiatric disorder. Um, I do want to mention that for the mood disorders, light at night um, puts kids at particularly high risk. So there's something about the light at night that not only um, disrupts the body clock, but also seems to affect serotonin, which is a brain chemical we need for a sense of um, well-being and to be in a good mood. And it's, light at night is strongly associated with not only mood problems, but even suicide, and there has been a huge increase in suicides in uh, middle school and high school kids. Um, so cognitively, I mentioned the ADHD is very common, learning disorders. Um, anxiety, we see a lot of social anxiety, obsessive compulsive symptoms. Neurologically, uh, any children with autism, their symptoms will get worse. And we see a, a huge increase in tics and Tourette's. Whether the child already has tics or not, they will get better if you take them off screens. So the result of all this is that there's a lot of kids who are on medication unnecessarily. Um, their treatments are they're you know, receiving treatments that are ineffective because the root cause isn't being addressed. 
and that really results in a misuse of health and education resources. Um, on top of that, we're seeing a lot of not just tech addiction, but all or other kinds of addiction as well are associated with screen time. And then eventually in the long term, we see academic failure, including in um, college students, especially young men are really struggling, and unemployment. <clears throat> so you can have, as I mentioned, you can have side effects from screen time and not necessarily be addicted. But if you are addicted, there's things that are very concerning about that as well. So we know from brain scan studies that um, young adults and adolescents who are addicted to video games or the internet, that they actually have atrophy of the gray matter in the frontal lobe. Their white matter is more fragmented, which is um, how the brain's connected to itself and to the body. Their cortex, or the outermost layer, is thinner. And um, they have abnormal processing or abnormal decision making. So all of these changes look very similar to the damage that we see in drug and alcohol use. So what's the solution for all of this? The, what I do with my, the people I work with is I call it the reset program. And basically it's a, a strict extended electronic fast for a minimum of three to four weeks. And we get rid of all interactive screen time. And what this does is it, this allows the body clock to resynchronize. It um, rebalances the stress hormones as well as the brain chemistry. And um, in doing so, this helps the blood flow return to the frontal lobe and improves the child's mood, cognition, and behavior. And it can be quite dramatic and in a matter of weeks, especially with uh, grade school kids. It can be within a matter of days. So at the same time, this helps clarify diagnosis, whether it's a mental health issue or a learning problem, and optimizes any treatment they're receiving, whether it's therapy or services at school, minimizes the need for any medication or eliminates it. And then it also, because their nervous system is now at their natural state, it provides a baseline for tolerability, which can vary quite a bit from kid to kid. So I just want to go over a couple cases really quickly. Um, Sophia was a 15-year-old girl at the time. Um, she had autism and ADHD. She came in one day um, crying, was hit, hitting herself, hitting her mother. I hadn't seen her like that you know, for a couple years. So as I was talking to the mother, the mother handed Sophia her smartphone. And I asked you know, wh why, had, why had they had started doing that, because this was a family that normally wasn't using screens. And she said um, she thought it was OK because her daughter had started an iPad program at school. So then we had two new sources of screens to explain her symptoms. So first we got rid of the smartphone use. Um, that cut her symptoms about in half. And then we worked with the school to get rid of the iPad program. And um, once they did, her, she went back to her baseline. The second case here is Ryan. He was eight years old. Um, he was in good mental health, no problems at school, got good grades. He had a gradual onset over a period of year of his grades falling, um, was disruptive in class, wasn't interested in learning anymore, stopped playing with his friends. His mother was taking him to all these different places in Los Angeles. First he was given a diagnosis of ADHD and then depression, and then finally diagnosed with autism because they just couldn't figure out what was going on with them. He was put on multiple medications. None of them worked. He was getting services at home and at school. Nothing was helping. So when I spoke to the mother, she, had, she said um, he'd been given a smartphone a year prior and basically was sitting in his room all day playing video games on his smartphone. So she, and she had asked me, you know, what should I do? And I said, you know, told her about my work and said, just try taking everything away for four weeks and see what happens. So he had a dramatic response. His, Mood improved. He became interested in learning again, started playing with his friends again, was playing outside. Um, and she was so impressed by the results that she ended up continuing with no video games. And three years later now, he continues to do well. He's not on any medication, doesn't need any services. So this is a good example of a child who went from looking relatively healthy to looking pretty sick and back to you know being a healthy child again. OK, so 
Um, these are some recommendations for kind of some policy changes that could be made. We really need to pace introducing technology to kids based on developmental needs and also individual needs, not just what we think they're going to need when they're grown up. We need to remember that restricting screens during youth actually protects the frontal lobe, and it's the frontal lobe that governs self-discipline. So in that way, by you know, restricting screens, we're going to help them um, be more likely to develop healthy screen habits as an adult. So that's kind of the irony. It's like the less exposure they get, the more likely they will be able to handle it later. We need to use um, electronic fa fasts regularly and liberally to reset their nervous system any child, anytime a child's dysregulated or struggling in school. Um, we need to use wired-only access, which Camilla will get into a little bit more detail. But this reduces not only the EMFs or the electromagnetic fields, it also re greatly reduces accessibility to the internet and it makes it a lot easier to control. In school, we need to have kids be allowed to do fast, just determine what's going on. Um, they need to be able to be opted out of iPad and laptop programs. From my experience, schools vary widely in how, you know, a lot of schools will give you the option to opt out. Other schools, you know, say they can't do it and their hands are tied. So that's a big issue. And they should be allowed other tech-related accommodations as well. Um, if they need to be screen-free altogether, be in a Wi-Fi-free classroom, or even just eliminating the um, light at night exposure with computer-related homework. So if you can't read that, this guy is saying, it keeps me look from looking at my phone every two seconds. <laughs> so this is just a reminder <laughs> that we know from human behavior that we're not very, none of us are very good at actually changing our habits. It's much easier to change the environment if we need to change something. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. And I know I was talking really fast, so <laughs> thanks for absorbing your thing. Thank you, Dr. Dunkley. That was, that was, we'll learn some new things. I've been looking into this for a while. But our next speaker is Tracy Markle, MA, LPC. She's out of Boulder. And she's worked in the field of mental health, recovery, and education for the past 25 years. Tracy and the team at Digital Media Treatment and Education Center, in collaboration with Collegiate Coaching Services, founded by Tracy in 2008, provide education, psychotherapy, and intervention support to clients who are 10 years old and older and their families who are impacted by the effects of technology and common coexisting factors. Please welcome Tracy. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm impressed with our crowd. I know you're going to have a lot of great questions for us. Um, so. I've been working with young people for the last 25 years, and I started out working with um, uh, chemical addiction and substance abuse and recovery, and just happened upon a, a student who had video game addiction and didn't quite understand it. This was, oh, well, about eight years ago, and figured out along the way how to work with this issue um, as well as I possibly can, and um, think we're doing a pretty good job at this point. Uh, with some good structures that we've put in place and some good standards of practice. So the majority of the clients that I work with and we work with in my practice uh, are middle school and high school and, uh, and more so young adults. And the young adult age group uh, tends to be the largest number that we work with because um, they're experiencing a great deal of failure at that level where intervention didn't happen soon enough with the screen overuse before they head off to college. Uh, Collegiate Coaching Services was founded to work with that issue at the time and figure out how to support these students to be successful in the academic arena and in life. Um, so I'm here to talk about the students who are most risk of overuse and addiction. And 
As we know with students in, in the academic arena, they all have different learning styles, they all have different ways of coping, different intelligence levels, different strengths and limitations. And I like to break it into three groups, the students that I'm going to speak about today. We have our neurotypical group. These are the students who have typical neurological development. Uh, they're supposed to learn okay and not have any deficits and um, cope okay and, and just be fine in the classroom. And we also have a group of students that fall under the umbrella of neurodevelopmental disorders. These are the students that have diagnoses that include ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, and specific learning disabilities. And this includes writing, reading, and math. It might be like dyslexia, uh, dysgraphia, if those ring a bell, and intellectual disorders. And we have groups of students who fall under the uh, category of having emotional issues and mental health diagnoses. What we do know about these different groups is many of these issues coexist together. So when you think about a student with autism spectrum disorder, it's very likely that they'll also have a diagnosis of an anxiety disorder and, and possibly even ADHD. So these students are dealing with a lot of deficits and a lot of limitations in a pretty overwhelming environment uh, in, in the school environment. So what causes these students to struggle and to prioritize and immerse into screens? And I talk about video games, social networking, um, overdoing their homework on the screen. And we have different groups of students that deal with different issues. So we have what I refer to our students who have novelty-seeking brains. These students are seeking stimulation, they're seeking immediate gratification. And when you think of novelty, it's something new. Our brain loves novelty. And when we seek something that's novel, our brain processes start to get activated, in particular our dopamine process. And that's our give me more uh, neurotransmitter. That's the motivating neurotransmitter. And so the more the student experiences that, the video game, the more they pursue it. The boring, mundane homework assignment, it's not gonna keep their attention. So if the student is dealing with executive function deficits, they have ADHD, they're on the autism spectrum, um, they, there's a level of depression, they find that they feel good when they immerse into these other applications. And we have a group of students who deal with academic challenges. Um, part of why they immerse into the screen and they'd rather play video games um, rather than do their homework is avoiding the stressors and the overwhelm in the school environment. They're getting a lot of pressure from their teachers, their peers, and their parents. And so they'll immerse even more into those applications that we would rather they don't do during the school hours or after school hours. Escapism is the number one reason why people immerse into video games. And that's an excellent way to feel better. I mean, when you think about, I just spoke about earlier, the, the novelty-seeking brain and the reward systems that, act, that show up, they're receiving a lot of reward and they're receiving a lot of dopamine release. And so they feel a lot better when they're in game or social networking rather than sitting there and doing their homework. Social connection is one of the most important um, part of treatment that I bring into my practice because I think it's one of the, the best remedies for helping somebody overcome addiction. And, it, and screen addiction, screen abuse is no different. What we find with this population overuses, and I just spoke about many of them who are in the high risk category of overuse, they have a really hard time with social connection and understanding social cues. And so the screen provides a refuge for them to meet people and connect and feel like they belong and feel like they're accepted, feel like they're part of something larger than themselves. I like to frame um, this uh, a student's ability to connect and be a part of something 
by talking about the self-determination self theory of student motivation. And basically what this theory says is we have a strong psychological innate need to get these needs met. And these needs include competence, a sense of competence, feeling like we're capable and we're able, and we can problem solve and autonomy, having a, a sense of uh, being in charge of what we're doing, uh, being able to be self-regulated in our environment, and a need for relatedness. And that need is really strong for young people. Identity development is a core part of what a child is going through in the middle school and high school years. And so connecting with a peer group and feeling like they're a part of something, a larger purpose, is really important for them. So when these students and these young people cannot get these needs met in a real life environment, whether that's in school, a sports team, 4-H, um, volunteer work, they'll find a way to get these needs met regardless. And screen applications have now provided them a way to get these needs met. Where before screen showed up on the scene, they would have to figure out how to get these needs met in real life situations. And so now we're in a situation where they immerse into the screens, they play the games, they get these needs met. So imagine a student in the classroom who has a computer open in front of them and these needs aren't getting met in real life and they're expected to choose between an application that makes them feel really good and connected and that like they belong and they feel competent or a homework assignment. I wonder what they're going to choose. So I'm going to give you an example of two options that these students are often encountering when they have their computer open and they're supposed to be doing their homework. they built to keep us safe or turn against us. And that's when they figured it out. They'll always need men like us. Those who are willing to do what others cannot. <laughs> Right? I mean, the reward, it, it just, would, you know, the patience, the immediate gratification wouldn't be there for him. So that video game is, it's, it's pretty incredible to watch and it gives you kind of an idea of what the students are playing and what the young people are playing. And so when they're sitting in front of the classroom and they have a choice of playing that game or they have a choice of doing their math word assignment, I wonder what they're going to choose. It's a no-brainer, right? I mean, I would choose a video game. I would choose social networking. And what's challenging, what's complicated to me when I see these young people in front of me and their parents are so frustrated because of this, the technology that's required in the school environment, is it's really no different than the student who comes and sits at their desk and there's a six-pack of beer sitting on their desk and they have a problem with drinking. And what we tell them is, don't look at that six-pack of beer. Don't touch it, and whatever you do, don't drink it. This is no different. These students are sitting here with screens, their homework, their academic tasks, their social networking, their video games. It's impossible for them to make a choice. It's out of their control. Okay, so let's talk about some of the prevalence rates that we have uh, that we um, find still very relevant. 8.5% um, of American youth age 18, 8 to 18 years old 
meet the criteria for pathological video game use, and I might say use the word addiction. And Dr. Young completed a study in 2011 where 13 to 18.4 percent of college students met the criteria for internet addiction disorder. These are pretty astounding percentages, and in my practical experience, I find, again, that they're very relevant um, and current. And so just imagine your school and how many of those students might actually have an overuse problem. There we go. So I'd like to talk about some of the impact of screen overuse on students. And if you think about those students who are at high risk, I spoke about earlier, are, are students with ADHD, anxiety, depression, autism spectrum disorder. Um, when they overuse screen, they, screens, they begin to use, experience other uh, complicated issues. And one of those is sleep deprivation. And this impacts, obviously impacts their academic performance, their immune system. They have a difficult time getting up in the morning and going to school. It impacts their physical, increases physical problems, carpal tunnel syndrome, back strain, eye problems, and in extreme circumstances, blood clots in the legs for sitting as long as they do. Personal hygiene and eating habits are greatly impacted. They are in game, their community is online, so the way they look, the way they present to the real world doesn't matter to them. Their eating habits are poor, they choose high sugary foods, high carb foods, energy drinks, poor academic performance, and that's what we're here to talk about, decline in study habits, drop in grades, emotional and mental health issues that Dr. Dunkley spoke quite a bit about, and that all important social connection. What I find with my clients who come in with screen overuse issues is they have dropped all of their real life activities. They no longer are involved in karate or soccer, and they have completely found all of their needs and their um, excitement online. So have we depressed you yet? It's, or, I, we're kind of downers, I think, but um, there's a lot of good things happening out there. There's a lot of great intervention. We're just, I know I'm struggling right now to figure out how to help families self-advocate with the schools and figure out how to minimize the, the computer access in the schools. And, and the problem is the schools don't know how to handle it. There, there wasn't a lot of foresight as far as what kind of guidelines and structure do we need in place before we require screens in the schools. So I just want to highlight we're working really hard at that and we have a lot of great tools and interventions in place. And I like to highlight the protective factors as my last um, section. I think it's important to know and how to find these in your child or your students so we can capitalize on them as strengths and this, is a, this coincides often with reducing screen time or requiring abstinence from screen time, but not always. It depends on the severity of the behavior and the use. Again, I can't stress enough connectedness, face-to-face -face connection. And I have parents who often come to me and say, but their friends are online, and that's the happiest I see them, and they're laughing, and I'm like, great but that's not going to help them go to college, get a job, and become independent. So we have to bring them in front of people, teach them the social skills, expose them to situations so they can begin to develop the skills and feel comfortable doing that. There's some innate characteristics that we found through different studies that are protective factors when it comes to personality. Extroversion, conscientiousness, and many of these students are very conscientious. They're aware of how their behavior is impacting them, how it's impacting others. Students who are resourceful, who are able to maneuver the situation and figure out how to ask for help, and who are agreeable, who generally want to follow the rules. And what I find is when we set up family agreements, we set up expectations and consequences and limit the screens, they really want to follow through. They just need a guide. They need somebody there to lead them and help them understand how to do that. 
Key factors I'm going to reiterate, and I've spoken to some of these, is emotional stability is our strongest predictor of, of students not immersing into screens. So that's where we come in and, and search out somebody who knows how to work with this issue and prioritizes it and doesn't talk with you about how this is just normal behavior now for teenagers. And I'm talking about psychiatrists, therapists, groups, and there's more and more resources out there. Teaching the social skills, helping them understand how to share perspective with other people, building empathy and understanding, they'll be accepted more in their social circles. Academic competence, I know for me, a lot of my clients are diagnosed later in life with different deficits. I think it's key that if you're confused about why your child's immersing in the screens, uh, maybe they don't have a previous diagnosis, it may be important to get um, set up educational, psychoeducational testing to rule out any issues that might be driving them into the screens that you're not aware of, a learning challenge, anxiety, ADHD. And also it's important to, um, you know, the accommodations are very critical and we're working with schools to figure out how they can start now accommodating students who have screen overuse issues. Again, it's a slow moving train, but we're making some progress there. And then clear, consistent technology and application use policies in the school. So that ends my time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Tracy. Was, uh, I don't know about you, but just amazing information we're getting here tonight. Our next speaker is Camilla Rees, MBA. She's a researcher, health educator, and expert on the biologic and health effects of RFR. She's founder of electromagnetichealth.org, Campaign for Radiation Free Schools, Manhattan Neighbors for Safer Telecommunications, and co-founder of the International EMF Alliance, Oslo. She authored The Wireless Elephant in the Room, co-authored Public Health SOS, The Shadow Side of the Wireless Revolution, and is Senior Policy Advisor to the National Institute for Science, Law, and Public Policy in Washington, D.C. Camilla lectures around the world, raising awareness of this issue that faces us all. Welcome, Camilla. Thank you very much, Christine, and it's great to be here. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, you know, we've heard today already about the, um, some of the screen effects and the, um, the addictive effects of this technology, but there is a wireless elephant in the room. This is a, uh, a new little booklet that's available online or through Amazon that kind of tells the bigger picture story, and it's a great handout to give to parents, schools, whatever. just want to make you avail uh, aware of it. But there, there is this elephant in the room, and when we talk about the wireless elephant, we're talking about the radiation that's emitted from, you know, not only the, the tower that you see in the picture, but from the Wi-Fi router in schools, and, and from um, all the devices that are connected, the computers, the laptops, the, um, the, the, uh, the printers, the, the tablets. And so um, we think of this, well, many people don't even think about the radiation, they just think that it's invisible and so it's not there. Well, many others um, think about it and realize that, these, that there is a wireless transmission occurring, but they think that um, if there was any problem with it, we would, have, um, we would have heard about it. It wouldn't be on the market, that somebody must have done some pre-market health testing on it or even post-market um, health surveillance. But there was no pre-market health testing done on any of these technologies. And in fact, it's, it's not some benign, neutral energy force out there. It's actually biologically active and biologically disruptive. Um, this is um, a graph that shows you the spread of wireless technology in the US between 2002 and 2012. It kind of says it all. And we're, the trajectory that we're on is to have more, even more and more wireless with the coming Internet of Things where everything in our lives, they, they want to have you know, wirelessly interconnected for no good reasons. Um, this is actually um, how we need to be thinking about this invisible stressor, this invisible energy force. It's 
It's, cons it's not some benign, static energy field. It's actually moving, and it's, 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 um, there are peaks and there are pulses, and, and it's disrupting the natural harmony that we have in our bodies. And it's uh, impacting every system of our body, every cell, and down to the level of DNA. Um, in 2011, the World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer classified the radiation as a class 2B pa possible carcinogen. And since that time, there's an increasing body of, of research, and there's really enough evidence today, people are making the case, that it should be upgraded to simply carcinogen. Um, what is this do radiation doing to our bodies? Well, we're seeing a tremendous increase in symptoms of electrosensitivities. Um, this, this can result in, um, see the list on the left, um, fatigue, sleep disturbance, irritability, um, d um, uh, it d memory problems, attention problems, focus problems, cardiovascular irregularities, um, memory, depression, difficulty concentrating, many things that are going to affect a child in school. And this is a book that um, ha from a UK charity, Electrosensitivity UK, that has published this book with 1,800 re research citations, if you want to look at some of the science. Um, so what are the biological effects that we know are happening from the science? And, and let me just say one other thing, that the safety guidelines today that the manufacturers have to comply with are based on a false premise, and this is the crux of the issue. The false premise is that the only harm, only harm, harm can only occur if, these, if this radiation is hot enough to heat the tissue, like the baked potato in the microwave oven. If it's not hot enough to heat the tissue, these very weak fields that we're exposed to right now, um, the, the, the idea is that, or the, <laughs> They we're led to believe that the, it's not biologically harmful. However, there are thousands of studies showing biological effects at non-heating levels of exposure. Here are some of them. We know that there's um, oxidative damage, mitochondrial dysfunction, melatonin depletion, um, increased blood viscosity, thickness in the blood, um, changes in hypothalamic regulation and cerebral blood flow, increased cortisol and adrenaline, mobilization of the mercury from your mercury amalgam fillings, um, it, reduction in neurotransmitters, calcium efflux from the, the cells um, be, being displaced. We know their genetic effects. They're now linked to nine cancers, have been linked to cell phone radiation, um, cellular molecular behavioral changes, nervous system effects, blood-brain barrier permeability, and in fact, all permeability in all the junctions in the body. They're supposed to be sealed tight. Cardiovascular, sleeping disorders, hormonal disturbance, immune effects, metabolic effects, autoimmunity. Autoimmunity actually in the clinical setting is being noted, often precedes electrosensitivity. Um, fertility impairment and impaired learning and um, blocks, the, this radiation blocks the body's ability to detoxify. And it also accelerates the growth and virulence of pathogens. Um, this was a study that actually began in Boulder, Colorado, that was published on the cardiovascular effects. It was a, um, people were exposed to 2.4 gigahertz portable phone, which is the same frequency of most home routers. And 40% um, of the subjects showed heart irregularities. Um, the worst case was the subject B here where on exposure, and it was a blinded study, so the person didn't know when they were exposed or not, there, um, this person's heart rate almost doubled, um, and 40% of the subjects were experiencing some difficulty. Now, we all know that um, usually there's a dose-response relationship between something, a linear relationship, where the more of something, the worse the effect. And, and that is the case with this radiation. In, but it's also the case that sometimes the less of the radiation, the worse the effects. And this was a study done in um, Sweden that, um, on rats that showed that the, um, the weakest fields were the most biologically active in terms of uh, reducing the um, number of neurons in the brain and increasing the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. So don't just think that, oh, well, I'm not really near that router, so I'm okay. It's, it's a room or two away. Um, there are different effects at different, um, 
different, different, different exposures. Here was the rat brain, the rat brains. This was in the equivalent of a teenage rat, 12 to 26 year old rats. And um, you see what happened just with two hours of exposure to their brain. And this, these um, effects were seen at 0.125% of what is considered the FCC safe, um, safe exposure limit or the guideline. So just um, how inadequate are these safety guidelines that we have that are based on this false premise that the only thing that matters is the heating effects? Well, this was um, an analysis done by a, a physician who saw psychological changes at 50 times less than the current exposure guidelines, DNA damage 600 times less, cardiac effects at 10,000 times less, enhanced cell proliferation 76,000 times um, less. Point is that the guidelines are completely inadequate and need to be changed. So we've done several programs on the electromagnetic effects on children. They're all, they've all been um, recorded and are available online if you'd like to go to um, electromagnetichealth.org. And um, this, was, these were, this was a summary of the research that was presented at a, at a forum in Connecticut with, um, let's see, who was it? Dr. Um, Martin Blank from Columbia, Dr. Hugh Taylor from Yale, uh, Dr. Deborah Davis and um, Dr. David Carpenter. And so um, things that were noted were, well, definitely effects in utero um, and cognitive function, attention, memory, perception, learning capacity, energy levels, emotions, poor sleep, DNA mutations, social skills, reaction time, motor function, <laughs> distraction, hyperactivity, inability to focus on long-term tasks, fatigue, impaired fertility, and um, an autism. And so, you know, if this was a food that you were giving to your child, you know, like, you know, we're just completely ignoring this wireless elephant in the room. Um, just a few more studies to point out. This was a study done in Russia um, by uh, the chairman of the Russian National Committee on um, Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, Dr. Yuri Grigoriev. And he's, it was in Russian, so he emailed me in English a summary of it, and he said, our recent four-year monitoring of effects from cell phone radiation on children demonstrates an increase in um, phonemic perception disorders, abatement of efficiency, reduced indicators for the arbitrary and semantic memory, and increased fatigue. Over the four, year, four years monitoring of 196 children ages 7 to 12 who were users of mobile communications devices, a steady decline in these parameters from high values to bottom standards compared to controls was observed. Um, Dr. Hugh Taylor did, at Yale did um, um, very important research with mice that showed that exposure in utero resulted in behavior in the mice once they were born, similar to attention deficit disorder. Mice don't get attention deficit disorder. Um, here's a quote from him. And by the way, he's just been recently um, uh, made a member of the National Academy of Medicine. Um, he says, um, a number of peer-reviewed studies reported changes in the nervous systems of rats, mice, and humans following exposure to cell phone radiation. These include diminished learning, diminished reaction time, decreased motor function, reduced memory accuracy, hyperactivity, and diminished cognition. And let me just remind you, the radiation from the cell phone is the same radiation that we're talking about that comes out of the wireless router. It's, it's the radiation that's the problem. Um, this is worth mentioning, done at King Saud University in Saudi Arabia. They, they were um, 159 students involved, 12 to 17 year old, years old. Um, they were in two different schools. Each school was 200 meters away from a cell tower. And, um, um, one, one tower was much more powerful than the other tower, and they looked at the hemoglobin A1C level, which is an indicator for type 2 diabetes, and there was a correlation between the, the power level in the, um, in the school that, uh, that had the higher power, had much higher levels of um, hemoglobin A1C. Whoops, did I just, yeah, okay. Um, this is a dosim what's called a dosimetry graph. It, it measures um, the radiation, um, not just in a static moment in time, but every half a second over a period of time. And this is a case in Massachusetts. It's actually the first case under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, a little boy was having difficulty concentrating in the school, and his mother um, had had him tracking how he was feeling in different classrooms for many months. 
And so um, he was in the habit of doing that. And then we loaned him the dosimeter, which he wore on several days over two different months into the school. And we were able to connect the time of the, um, the symptoms, like the strong headaches. You see, were where the, the, the radiation was peaking and pulsing. And the, the, in, on this chart, the green dotted line is the bioinitiative safe level, recommended level for, um, for exposure. Um, and this was a report um, written by several scientists from many countries trying to synthesize the, the science on this subject, independent of uh, scientists that have no industry connection. And so as you can see, the, um, the, the red lines underneath are the average exposures. And so the school in this case brought in somebody and they said, well, they looked at their meter and they said the, the average exposures here, you know, seem okay. But the body doesn't respond to averages. The body res is responding to those peaks and pulsing. And so you have a handout here that, that gives, um, you know, one of these charts and, and some other points that you need to really understand about how the Wi-Fi is affecting children. Um, so what, what was clear is that actual exposures in school with Wi-Fi are well above the recommended levels. Wi-Fi routers in school you need to know are industrial strength routers designed to penetrate through cement to handle hundreds of users and to extend the signal, signal into a very large area like perhaps a campus. Um, Wi-Fi routers in schools also keep getting stronger and the technology changes. Newer router systems are directional in nature, which means that one student in a classroom could be more exposed than, than the next. Um, in your handout packet, if you could pick up at the back of the room, um, there's um, a document, 20 Elements of Electromagnetically Clean and Conscious School. And the point is that we can do a lot better. People say, well, it's, it's you know, how do, what do we do? We, we all have Wi-Fi at schools. We gotta have Wi-Fi, but it's actually not the case. This is a company in Sausalito, California, OctaWired. This divide, d designed many scenarios for how you can hardwire a classroom. And um, um, it turns out that um, the estimate is $500 per classroom on their website. Um, you can replace the wireless access points with gigabit switches. And the cost to do this, including all the equipment and the two hours of estimated labor time to install is $500 a classroom. Um, now, in a, if you hardwire the classroom, well, you've, got it, you've got iPads and tablets and things that, aren't, that don't have an Ethernet port. And so um, there are ways to, um, to modify, to add adapters to a, an iPad. Um, and it's actually quite simple, and there are a couple of articles here. One is by building biologist Ora Miller of Create Healthy Homes in Los Angeles. He's got a great article on how you do that. Also, Life Hacker, where this picture comes from. And um, so it is doable. Many people are doing it. Parents are doing it at home. And um, it's, it's definitely um, something that we all need to be thinking about. Now, in terms of cell phones and brain tumors, um, the research, even back in 1999, industry's own research showed um, an increased incidence of, of brain tumors from cell phone use. This was in um, industry and government, US government funded research. The bad news is that children and small adults absorb far more radiation. Um, two times the radiation to the head as adults, up to three times the, in the brain's hippocampus and hypothalamus, greater absorption in the eyes, <clears throat> as much as 10 times more in their bone marrow as compared to adults. The, the standards, whoops, the, um, the, the safety standards that the, um, the, 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 well, the, the standards that the FCC uses as part of their recommended guidelines do not protect for children. And we actually have a query into the FCC right now to, to ask them, you know, how can you possibly justify that what you have here is um, protective of children when, when the, the, tech, the, the assumptions on which it, the standards are based were, are not protective of children. Um, this was one study um, that showed risk um, of brain tumors from cell phones to children, 680% increased risk of brain cancer from cell phones on the side of the head where the cell phone was used began as a teenager or younger, and children have nearly four times the risk compared to adults. Um, so you might hear that, well, if, if the cell phones are so bad, why aren't we seeing more people with brain tumors? Well, we are in many different cancer registries. 
Um, this is a, a chart from England that I just, I just got that is very interesting. If you look at the bottom line, the black line is the growth in the tumors in the frontal and temporal lobe of the brain, the most the areas most um, likely to be exposed to the cell phone radiation. So those are definitely going up over time. The blue line is all the other tumors, and that's pretty much flat. So some tumors, you know, um, are, are not going up. Frontal and temporal lobes definitely are, and the ones that are really um, grow, growing fast are the glioblastoma multiform, which are the most um, deadly. Um, actually, let me just also tell you that the, um, I don't think I have this chart, the, um, the, the, the glioblastoma tumors, the, the, the highest growth rate that we're seeing in that is in the zero to 19 and 85 plus years. And um, about, I think it was 20, 23% between the epic in 1998 to 2002, that period, and um, 2008 to 2012, those two epochs were compared, and it was a 23% increase in children zero to 19 years of age, and something close to that for um, 19 to 35. Um, so despite all the evidence that we're, we, you know, the biological effects, the effects on DNA, we're still, we're still allowing children to use this technology. Um, there are also um, fertility effects on children from the radiation. Def this is a Cleveland Clinic study showing a dose response um, connection where the, the greater the cell phone exposure, the, the worse the effect on the sperm. Um, in the highest exposure group, one third of sperm count was lost with over four hours of male cell phone use, and 50% of the remaining sperm showed physical abnormalities, did not swim well, or were non viable. There's lots of research on this. and. Um, many studies, we have a document that's for parents to, to learn about this on electromagnetic health. This is an ad that was developed in England by our colleagues at the Radiation Research Trust that is um, in, in bathrooms in London over the urinals, teaching young men and boys not to put the cell phone in the pocket. Um, in, France, they're actu in France, they're actually, pro men are protesting in their underwear in the streets to protest the, the science showing the very clear fertility impacts. This was from a, um, a study of, done by 12 institutes in seven countries in Europe called the Reflex Report, and it just so, graphically shows the, um, the impact on the DNA. The, the top one is the no radiation exposure. The left one is 1,600 chest x-rays, the fragmentation of the DNA, and 24-hour cell phone exposure is you know pretty comparable. So um, we're also seeing more and more wearable wireless technology. Um, this was a study showing the impacts on uh, tumors and women wear the cell phone in the bra. But you know people are wearing these things close to their body and in sports clothing. And um, there's a bathing suit, very bright girl who doesn't know better. Um, wearable wireless category grow, expected to be 51 to 71 million by 2022. And we're starting to see the virtual reality and, and immersive, more immersive experiences. This is not here yet, but this is in China, virtual reality classrooms. Um, so the question is, and uh, Dr. Dunkley um, touched on this as well, is, is this, is this um, technology actually helping the educational goals um, that the schools have for children? This study was done by, <coughs> excuse me, MIT researchers at at, um, the, uh, at West Point, and they said that it was un it's unclear whether the benefits of internet-enabled commuter, commu computer usage in the classroom outweigh its potential cost to student learning. So they did this study in an introductory economics course where certain um, students for the duration of the term were allowed to have computers in the classroom and others had no, no computers in the classroom. And they showed that the results from our randomized experiment suggest that computer devices has, have a substantial negative effect on academic performance. And this is among a very bright group of students at West Point. So, um, you know, um, as one of my teachers, Dr. Dietrich Klinghardt, has said, we are cooperating with a deliberately destructive technology. And it's good to see that um, 
that some of the truth is coming out on this. Just recently, the um, California Department of Public Health was exposed for suppressing a report that they did seven years ago on cell phone risks, a front page of the San Francisco Chronicle. And, and UC Berkeley professor um, Joel Moskowitz sued to, to get that report released. It was just released. Um, we're also seeing two weeks ago, I think Anderson Cooper starting to cover the, the technology addiction issue and the, and the fact that these the computer programs are, are being designed intentionally to, um, um, to addict you and hijack your brain is what they said. So I would be very careful who you receive your information from on this. Make sure that you're listening to people that don't have an industry connection, that there are no conflicts of interest. Here is what the American Academy of Environmental Medicine says about Wi-Fi in schools. Um, adverse health effects from wireless radio frequency fields such as learning disabilities, altered immune responses, and headaches clearly exist and are well documented in the scientific literature. Safer technology, such as the use of hard wiring, is strongly recommended in schools. Thank you. Wow, is everyone full <laughs> of all these wonderful tidbits? So it's good that we're going to be having this on uh, YouTube so we can revisit this again. Our next speaker is Sherry Kiesiker. She's a Colorado parent and active advocate for children's privacy. She's a frequent blogger and member of many organizations, including Parent Coalition for Student Privacy. Sherry and Leonie Helmson wrote a Washington Post article explaining the many ways student data is being collected and shared. Welcome, Sherry. Hey, everybody. I'm trying to do this. Thank you all for coming and sitting. And if you need to get up and stretch, I won't be offended, really. Um, so my topic overlaps a little bit, but I'm also very different. So all of these brilliant women talked about the increase of devices in our world and in school. And they're looking at it from the invisible wireless radiation. I'm looking at it from the invisible data. And I'm sure we're all familiar with data. We use it every day. You get advertisements in your mail based on your shopping habits, based on the little card you swipe at the store. Every time you swipe your credit card, that data is bought by someone. And I call it overt and covert data in schools. So in schools, when you register someone, you register your child as a kindergartner, you have to register, and they get your maternal history, they get your medical history, they get you know any kind of information you want to share about your child. I know I overshared, thinking that I wanted the teacher to know everything about him, you know his food allergies and his when he gets tired, please don't be mean to him. You know, you, you share everything thinking you're doing the best for your kids, and you send your kids to school thinking it's going to be a safe place. And I think that's where we need to come together in this, is I don't think that there's any one out there that really wants to harm kids. But the bottom line is, it, it comes down to money, and it comes down to the powers that be that make the money are selling these products. And they don't always tell us all the information. And it, it's hard to get information as a parent. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to find out what kind of information is being collected on your child, who sees it, how it's being shared, sold, marketed, profiled, analyzed. And I know I've been after this with many other parents in this room for a long time, trying to find that out. And thankfully, we've had Colorado legislature who helped us pass a data privacy law last year for students. And really all that law does is create a little bit of transparency for parents so that they can go find from the vendors who they share the data with and the data elements that are collected. And it's, it's proving pretty hard to enforce because there's no penalty for noncompliance. But for those that are the school districts, it gives the school districts a little bit of help 
in finding out, even for them, it's hard for them to know where the data goes and who uses it. So I'll kind of start through this slideshow. I'll give you a, a little bit of a warning. It's a long slideshow, so I'm going to click through some of these. But at the end and on my handout, there's a link. So you can access all of this. And it's very heavily linked with different documents and research. So you can do your own research. And I suggest you do, because it's a really big topic to try to cover in 10 minutes. But it's very important. And if we leave here, I just want you to know, if you're familiar with your credit score, you have commercials on TV, freecredit.com, check your credit, make sure it's accurate. You can go in, and it's going to affect how you, if you can buy a house, sometimes if you get a job, your credit score is a little bit of your shadow identity. For children, their shadow identity starts from preschool, sometimes birth in different states. And it's something we can't access, we can't check for accuracy, and it's making predictions and decisions about them. And we have no way to control that data footprint at this point. There are no regulations on that. And if you're familiar with Edward Snowden and the NSA type of wiretapping and data and the metadata, the metadata is what happens when you're online and it's data about the data. It's your IP address, it's how long you clicked, it's what websites you looked at and for how long. And for children, you'll see there's software programs that tag everything they write. So it's tagged down, they can say tagged down to the atom, but they can collect five to 10 million data points per child per day. And that's a lot of data, and that's just one company. And that all gets funneled back into a system. And so any data miner can go in and kind of pull and repurpose data and use it to analyze and, and profile and predict how this child is going to grow up and what kind of career or college workforce they may be best designed for. And if you have no access to see that data, you don't know if it's accurate or not. So this is. Um, each one of these blue lines is a link, so you're free to take a look at that anytime. One of the things we hear quite a lot is, well, data is safe because it's covered by these laws. Unfortunately, the Federal Education Rights and Protection Act, our Privacy Act, um, it's 40 years old. It was written before data was a thing, before there were computers, and so it, it covers paper doesn't really cover data. It does not cover third-party vendors when Google takes my child's data and then sells it to somebody else. It doesn't cover that data. And in 2011, it was weakened even further to the point where parents do not get to consent and don't even get notified when their data, when their children's data is farmed out for research or for, for some other purpose. You have no, no say. So FERPA has some loopholes in it, and if we could change one thing, I would say revert back to pre-2011 and fix those loopholes that allow children's data to leave school walls without parent consent. Um, PPRA covers things like religion, alcohol use. Um, there's, there's eight sensitive areas that it's supposed to cover, but that's not enforced in schools. It's, it proves very difficult. We have surveys in the classrooms quite often saying, you know, what's your sexual history? What's, what's you know, do you have gun, um, military? We, what's your religion? There's a lot of questions in the classroom that should be covered under PPRA and it doesn't get covered. We have full-blown personality tests in some of these vendors and parents don't see the personality test, don't know what's happening, don't see the results and that gets sent out to a different company and in one case it gets sent to the Gallup poll. So there's a lot of data collected on our kids, and these laws aren't protecting it. And I think the number one worry here is the HIPAA is not protected in students' records. So when you have an education record, it's not a medical facility, therefore HIPAA doesn't cover it. And we're seeing cropping up of school-based health centers because it's a school, and the school can authorize the, the vendor as a school official, FERPA won't prohibit that data from being shared in most cases, and HIPAA doesn't cover it because it's school-based. So it's a problem, and we're collecting a lot of behavioral, medical, mental health data in schools right now. So 
So this is just going on, saying that there's a lot of different venues for the data to be collected. And it can be repurposed and marketed. Um, one thing I was going to mention is in China, they have a system that they use your data. It's just started. It's called Sesame Credit. And your data score can depend what you do, how you interact with other people, who you're friends with, if you speak out against your superiors or the government, if you pay your bills on time. It affects your data score, your Sesame Credit score. And if you have a lower Sesame Credit score, you might not have good job opportunities, or you might not get the same pay as somebody with a better Sesame Credit score. In the United States, someone has a patent on that that is similar. So in the United States, there's, it hasn't started yet, but um, Mark Zuckerberg has a patent on that. And currently, Facebook claims to know your posture. They can map your face. They can listen to your smartphone conversations. They can even claim they can recognize you from the back of your head. And so with this patent on who you're friends with, with face on Facebook and social media could determine your credit worthiness. So if you think about that, and you think about what's happening with children and all of their data being collected, it's a little scary because they're going to grow up completely under surveillance and no way of being control, in control of their own data identity. This man is um, Jose Ferrar. He's from a, a software curriculum provider called Newton, K-N-E-W-T-O-N. And there's, if you click on this, it's a little 30-second blip from his um, White House data palooza uh, presentation he gave, and he, he claims that education today is the most data mineable industry by far. They get five to ten million data points per day per child, five um, orders of magnitude greater than Google has data on someone. And they tag every sentence, and then they share that data. And the part of the, the biggest problem is, is our U.S. Department of Education believes in a data-driven education. And so there's this over-reliance and this over-trust of data, thinking that data can't be wrong, and the more data, the better. But there's also a philosophy of garbage in, garbage out. And if you get the wrong data to start with, your whole premise could be wrong. And if you can't see the own data collected about you, then your, your entire future path could be decided based on this incorrect data. And the, the point um, that was made for the addiction piece, these companies, like the 60-minute interview that was out this week, these companies know it's addictive. And they're putting these um, devices in the hands of kids, and they're turning curriculum into games to keep the kids more engaged. So there's more and more gamification in the classroom and virtual reality in the classroom to keep kids on the screens longer, and then you get more badges and more awards and you try to compete and you get little email reminders that you know you're only third in the class now you need to get back on there and do that more and parents are getting notifications from Khan Academy your kid needs to be on here longer and in it's a way to just keep them on that screen and it's very much enforcing this uh, addiction behavior that we see and the bottom one here the SEL is social emotional learning we're moving towards focusing more on how a child learns versus what they learn. So your emotions and your behaviors are becoming more graded than potentially the content and the knowledge of what you learn. The data quality campaign is a um, Gates-funded organization, Bill Gates. And in 2009, well, Ten organizations came together with the, at the U.S. Department of Education Summit and said that they wanted to begin this data-driven education. And in order to make that happen, they wanted in each state a giant data warehouse that would track each child's data in each state. And that's called the State Longitudinal Data System. And they wanted that by 2009, and we do have that now, and every state, Colorado, has one. 
and um, Colorado starts in uh, K through 12 as our SLDS, but then we also have preschool, and then it links with that. And right now, since we have the SLDS database where our schools upload all of the data to the, the state database, um, the next step that Data Quality Campaign has really been pushing for is to expand and link all of these databases in different states to create one national database that is currently banned by law, but they're trying to lift that ban to make it easier to make this data interoperable and share it widely. Um, and if you look on the handouts that are on the table here, the data are tagged so they're coded so that it's very easy to compare different homeless value is one tag, um, ADHD could be a different tag. And so there's over 400 data tags in um, the state database and there's I think something like 1700 data tags in the federal database now. And on those handouts, it's got like a little, just a little screenshot of some of the things that you can see. I mean, it's very detailed and it does have name, parents' name, health. It's pretty fascinating when you start looking into this. But um, the very bottom one is the thing that also concerns me is because we're starting to standardize uh, emotions. So there's a commission that is currently underway to standardize children's emotions because it's important to understand a child's background, of course. But by doing so and uploading that information and standardizing it, you're measuring someone's emotions and you're grading them on their emotions. And that's a very subjective thing to grade. And it's a very big ethical question whether we should be grading children in school on their behavior and their emotions, and then uploading that onto the, a data badge. And the, the data badges and this 21st century skills, we hear that a lot, that we're measuring 21st century skills. When I first heard that, I thought it was whether they could use a computer or do science or math. It's not, it has nothing to do. It's, it's mostly if they're a leader, if they're um, aware, if they're alert, if they're an advocate. It's a lot of um, work ethic, how they think, how they act. They collect all this data, yet our US Department of Education has had multiple data breaches and received an F on their security score because they can't keep the data secure yet it's mandatory that our children's data be uploaded. We can't opt out of it. They've promoted a lot of ed tech companies that give grants. This is Digital Promise, a very huge um, nonprofit that the US Department of Education created to innovate schools and get one-to-one -one devices into classrooms. It's really hard to get people to understand that just one click or somebody watching your website is a big deal. But there was a nearly $5 million grant to the Carnegie Foundation and National Science Foundation to create this project called LearnSphere. And what this project did was make it possible to track a child's movement across the internet, across any web-based um, platform for pretty much their entire life. They can just take all of every single mouse click, every click stream, stream data is stored on that child so they can see millions of data points about that child across their lifetime and then combine that data to use it in predictive analytics. And here are just a few of the um, data-driven, data mining publications that the US Department of Education has put out. Um, helping ed tech developers in the classroom, promoting grit, um, and that's part of those 21st century skills. And uh, this is the same publication. They, they talk about studies at MIT that how they're able to measure spatial expressions and uh, 
track mouse clicks and pressure on the mouse and pressure on the seat and blood pressure. And we have a lot of teachers now saying that um, these innovative classrooms that would like children to wear Fitbits or some sort of you know health tracker, not necessarily Fitbit, but any one of those, so that the teacher could see in real time that Johnny over here, his heart rate must is racing, so he must be really excited about this content, or so. So they can just they can track everything about that child, but the problem is, is it doesn't stay in the classroom, and so all of this data is being uploaded on these children. The Federal Learning Registry is a joint data gathering mission between the U.S. Department of Defense and the U.S. Department of Education. And this next slide that I'm going to show you is a little video snippet, and it's, it's about a 40-minute video, but I, I had just a 30-second video snippet in there. And he's talking about how much data Amazon gets and how much money they make on that data. And they, the U.S. Department of Education wanted to get on on that, too. And um, what they, they've done is contracted with technology vendors to help them gather the data. And so um, this was in 2011, and they have now been able to do that. So instead of having textbooks in the classroom, we do these one-to-one -one devices. And we have something called free curriculum, and it's the Go Open curriculum distributed through the White House. Amazon um, hosts the cloud platform for it. So Amazon helps handle the data, so does Microsoft. And all of this data gets funneled back to the, the learning registry. Um, and it's free, except the problem with these, these free technologies is they're not free because you're paying for, your, for the price of it with your children's data, because data is money. Data brokers buy and sell data, and when a company goes bankrupt, as in the case of, let's see, Radio Shack, that data that they have is a commodity and they sell that. They make a lot of money on the data that they have collected on their users because it's very predictive and they can use it for marketing and product development. In Colorado, we have something called a golden record on each child. It's a golden record of each child's data. And that, that's similar to what they have. This was a, at an informatic uh, conference and this was our CIO of, um, in our Colorado Department of Education, talking about how we have a golden record of data on each child, and he, the video, you can click on this, and the video goes through and says that they share with different departments and different state agencies. This is a really interesting website. The Electronic Frontier Foundation is a good guy. They're uh, a watchdog group that looks out for data privacy, and a couple of years ago, they filed a complaint against Google for spying on children in the classroom. And at that same time, they started a survey on their webpage asking parents, log on, tell us what devices are used in your classroom, what experience you've had with opting out, if you've been able to not use a particular program, if you've had problems, just give us that in, you know, feedback. And they just re uh, released this report on their two-year study and um, it's really, really interesting because some of the feedback they got was from actual IT people in schools that said, we don't know where the data goes. We really don't. But because there's such a push to get these, these devices in and the, the myth that it makes it easier and it's just, I don't know, you're an innovator if you put a device in a child's hand and we're having a hard time. In one school district, there was a dumpster of books last week. They're throwing away books so that we can get devices. This video um, is from a congressional hearing on student data privacy. And the professor linked at the top is speaking, and this was in 2015. And this is a really interesting video to watch. It's very informative. Um, it was a subcommittee on how emerging technology affects student privacy. And he, he tells you that FERPA does not cover data. It does not protect against third-party vendors. And it's the metadata that children use, that, that is collected when children use online apps, is not covered. It's not protected. 
um, one of the members of Congress was trying to understand what he meant by data collection and there was a panel of, of several um, IT folks and, and privacy experts and he asked, so just explain to me um, what, what would this data look like if, let's say, from, you know, if I was a student from kindergarten through 12th grade or college, how much data would you collect on me or what would that be? And Professor Reidenberg, who's a, an attorney from Forden uh, Center on Law and Information Practices, says, it think George Orwell to the, ninth, the nth degree. It's ubiquitous, ubiquitous surveillance. Data emerged from your home life and the classroom. It's a rich set of data about you, and it's captured, and it's synthesized, and it can be analyzed and shared. And the way that it's analyzed are, are programs called algorithms. It's software programs, and you can, a software developer can create a program to analyze anything, and then they use that to predict. So there are keystroke algorithms that can detect 15 different emotional states. So they claim that by a child's keystroke data, they can tell whether they're angry or um, have anxiety or, you know, 15 different emotions. There's an algorithm based on your Twitter punctuation, whether or not you'd be good risk for insurance. There's just an algorithm use is endless. And again, they're black box. No one can see them and no one can see if they're accurate or how they're used. And on the bottom here are a list of just a few of the uh, classroom apps and programs that, that children use today. And they each have some sort of article about them with their privacy risk. So they're interesting to kind of go in and look at. And I didn't have room for them. There's, there's hundreds. There's one right now called iReady, and it's being promoted heavily in every state, and Colorado has iReady as well, and um, they use it a lot for reading. And um, I, one teacher that I talked to, she said the iStation, which is part of the iReady, did not align with other measures of literacy, including the DRA, which is the... Um, a, a test that we are mandated to use f from the State Department of Education. Um, and so another teacher said that her best readers in second grade who didn't have a whole lot of tech experience were dinged um, by, by this iStation test and said that they were not proficient when really they were the best readers in the classroom. And I can say by personal experience, one of my children between kindergarten and second grade kept getting these horrific scores for reading and we were reading at home and I was in the classroom reading with him and his reading groups all the time. And the teacher said, oh, don't worry about it. It's just that program. It times out on him. It, 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 it's not accurate. We just have to do it. But had the teacher not overridden the program, my son would have had a completely different data footprint. And it goes on and on. But... Um, this is the scary part because your data footprint is making decisions about you and you don't even know. And for children, if you have a lifetime of data collection, both from the school sending it to this database and from all of the online activity with you know 50,000 data points per hour from Dreambox Math to five to 10 million from another provider, all being funneled over a lifetime and they can track that, how much data is out there about your child, and what decisions is it making about their career prospects, their insurance? It, it gets kind of overwhelming, and as a parent, you try to ask for it, and you don't get to see it. And a lot of students are starting to worry about when they're using these online programs, they're predicted. So, like in my son's case, if he didn't answer this question right, you get stuck in the loop and you keep doing it over and over until you master that loop. Well, it wasn't that he didn't know what he was reading. He was distracted and the program timed out, and so he just kept staying on this loop. And it was because it was on a screen. He doesn't do well on screens. So there's a lot of factors with technology that you just can't predict everything. And these two here are very, very interesting. 
Yet Analytics is something that just came out, and they, um, they're an analytics uh, corporation, and they've partnered with HP, and this, this uh, article is The Future of Human Capital Analytics, Artificial Intelligence, and Your Reputation Score. And your reputation score is your data footprint. It's your shadow identity. And they have a lot of different and interesting ideas in here. But what they're talking about is an artificial brain, which is a computer, um, to help uh, assist in identification and forecasting on return of investment. So if you're a business or a government and you want to know how much money you're spending on a particular child and whether it was worth it or not, you can start analyzing all of this data and whether it's good data or not is the problem. But based on that, you're going to have a reputation score much like that Sesame credit where your data is now your reputation. And on the bottom, the Global Education Futures, is uh, there are several futurist groups that predict what is going to happen, and these happen to be education futurists. And you can look at this, this map that they have and their, their um, annual, uh, I guess it's like a brochure that they put out. And, and what, they, what they expect to be happening is happening every year. And they're predicting that we're going to move away from brick and mortar schools and have online education. And we'll have billion student universities where a professor in Kentucky or not even a human someplace will be teaching to all the other children. And it'll be the same, same content delivered. And then all these, of course, all the data will be collected online. They're really interesting if you get a chance to take a look at those. And data is money. Blockchain is literally money. Data is money. Your children are being monetized. And um, this Silicon Valley plan book said that uh, changes in education law could unlock um, a $1.2 trillion in global economic value just in student data. $1.2 trillion. And here's the link to... Um, this slide presentation and a whole lot more research if anyone's so inclined. And it's also got my email. I'm just putting it out there. It's already out there everywhere. So, But please, please look into it and please feel free to ask questions. Thanks. All right, we are gonna change directions just a little bit. We've had these four amazing in-person panelists. We're gonna do a little technological feat, hopefully, and we're gonna bring in uh, Cindy Eckhart, our next panelist on Skype. Cindy Eckhart is a Maryland parent who has spearheaded legislation in her state that aims to create medically sound safety guidelines for the use of digital devices in public schools. Her op-eds have appeared in the Baltimore Sun, the Washington Post, and BAM Radio Network's blog, EdWorks. Tonight, Cindy is gonna join us from Maryland via Skype, and we'll be talking about her experience with the legislative process regarding screen safety guidelines in schools. She's also going to discuss some of the documented medical risks for children associated with daily digital device. And it's late in Maryland, so when we're finished with Cindy, if anyone has a question for her, We'll take that question right away. Then we will wrap things up a little bit. I want to thank our sponsors. And then if there are any questions for the audience, we'll take those. So with that, we will see if we can get Cindy on the line and, and go forward. Thanks. OK, great. Thank you so much. Thank you for allowing me to join in this really important event. Thank you to Heather and Christine, Sherry. A lot of work went into this, and it's very exciting to be part of a nationwide effort to make sure that our classrooms are safer for our kids. The movement is underway, and as everybody knows, you don't mess with moms. We will get this done. Um, my own involvement started with my parent-teacher conference when I sat down with all the teachers and I learned how much screen time my children were spending at school. 
my career goes back into the 80s where even back then we knew the dangers of using digital devices. I insisted, for instance, on a window seat so that I could look long distances and take lots of breaks. So I said, of course, there are guidelines in place for this. And everybody looked at me and I said, oh, no, no, no. Of course, there are safety guidelines. These are kids. And, and these issues have been known for decades. Silence. So I went to the state board and I said, you have guidelines. Maybe the local jurisdiction doesn't know about this, but you guys certainly do. Oh, no, they said, this is a local issue. So back to the schools I went and got no satisfaction. There was no understanding of the risks that the children face. We went then to the state legislature last year and tried to get something done, but we got a late start because of the timing of the parent-teacher conference. After a year's worth of study, it became more and more alarming to me as a parent that these devices were not totally checked out, that a risk analysis wasn't done before they were distributed to little kids and, and older kids. The risks are serious. They start with myopia, which is epidemic in our country and around the world. Myopia is in such a huge number around the world right now. Places like Taiwan are, are passing laws for the parents limiting screen time. Myopia has doubled in our country in the last 50 years, and that was proven by the Roski Eye Institute in California. So the longer that a child is gazing into something at a fixed distance, he's at greater risk for myopia. The next risk is retinal damage. The blue light that's emitted from these screens is extremely dangerous, particularly to children. As adults, the pigment in our eye provides a little bit of protection from that blue light. A child has none. The blue light from these screens are going straight into the back of that eye and damaging cells permanently. The other issue that's going on with the screens is all of us blink 66% less often when we're online. So a kid is actually staring right into that blue light that's damaging his retina. He's not gonna get those cells back. It's permanent and it's cumulative. So when you consider a kindergarten child on five years old all the way through graduation staring at screens, you can begin to understand the damage we're looking at. The other issues are obesity because of lack of exercise and also sleeplessness, which is linked to obesity. The sleeplessness is really playing havoc with our kids because the blue light is suppressing the melatonin that enables the child to fall asleep. A sleepy child doesn't concentrate, is irritable, has a lot, of, a lot more trouble in school, and also becomes depressed. Additionally, not sleeping in a child is different from not sleeping in an adult. The Sleep Foundation tells us that kids get hyper when they're tired. You and I might get a little drowsy. Kids get hyper. And so the sleeplessness is actually being misdiagnosed as ADHD. There's a whole universe of health issues revolving around these computers. And I'm sure that you've heard tonight about anxiety, depression, and addiction. And that's really becoming problematic. The kids can't put them down. And the schools themselves are adding to that problem. So what do you do as a parent? I went to the General Assembly. We got 26 co-sponsors for our House bill. And we raised awareness. We got the Medical Society of Maryland to endorse this bill. For the first time, we also got the American Academy of Pediatrics to back us up because they have only been addressing entertainment uh, screen time in the home. This time, the Maryland chapter said, no, we need regulations in our classrooms. So as a parent moving forward, I will be talking with the Department of Health for the state of Maryland. I have found that it is really already their responsibility and I will hold them accountable. Conversations are already begun in that area. But everybody wants to say it's the school's issue. Schools are not doctors and these are serious health risks. So it's the health department's feet we need to hold to the fire. As regards the schools, the first things that parents really need to do is get a full accountability of the amount of time their child is required to be online at school. They are very, very uh, hesitant to share that information, and it's key. Once you see how much your child is online 
and you weigh that against the risks, you too will become an advocate. I can't thank you enough for this evening. I really appreciate the opportunity. And I know that working together with the amazing Sherry Kaisecker and Victoria Dunkley and all the rest of the panelists that we can fix this for our kids. Does anyone have any questions for Cindy before we move forward? And if so, would you come up to the podium and ask, and they'll be relayed to her. Um, if not, we'll let Cindy go to bed. <laughs> OK, we have one? Yeah. How can we follow your work, Cindy? Do you have a website or um, you know, just so we can not have to reinvent the wheel? Thanks, yes, I have a website. It's www.screensandkids.us. And I've uh, recently explained the Alice in Wonderland experience of the General Assembly. On it, you'll also find all the documentation for the medical research that's been done. Uh, so please join us there at screensandkids.us. So I wanted to ask about the retinal damage. Um, what does this translate into as far as visual impairment and how long does it take for that to uh, be seen? I, I think I got that question, yes. And that, it's an excellent question. Um, the rubbing of the eyes, the blurry vision, uh, the dry eye uh, disease that we're looking at, you're, you're seeing that already in your kids. One wonderful ophthalmologist testified with us at the Senate, and he explained in detail, and his testimony is online as well at, on my website, that the kids are not even realizing that they're not blinking. So you're already seeing the damage that's being done to these kids. The problem, and for me, the most nefarious part of this uh, situation is that a lot of people are saying, well, we don't have the data because the kids haven't been online long enough. And so essentially they're waiting for collateral damage in our children before they take any action. And that's what we're trying to prevent. This is all preventable. Turning the things off, taking a break, stretching, blue light uh, screens, and just common sense use of these things instead of, for instance, the park testing and the standardized testing that have our kids strapped online for hours and hours and they're not even allowed to move. Common sense will, will fix this. Um, but you should talk to your eye doctor, as I did, to find out if your kid is already at risk uh, for additional myopia or retinal damage. Thanks, Cindy. We have a question from one of our panelists. Um, yes, hi, this is Camilla Reese, and um, I was wondering if you could speak to the report that was issued by um, an agency in the state of Maryland on Wi-Fi in, wi in schools. Are you familiar with what I'm referring to? I'm very familiar with that work. I'm very familiar with the people behind it, with Dr. Cliff Mitchell, who heads up CPAC. Uh, Theodora Scarato is extraordinarily instrumental in that work. I am familiar with it. Um, and I think that it's an important issue, the routers and the Wi-Fi, for me personally, um, because I'm just a mom and I limited my research to those things that I knew personally were impacting the people around me. I limited it to the, the issues you've heard me discuss, but absolutely the Wi-Fi issue in Maryland. And I believe that the summary of that was to have the FCC review their standards to see if they couldn't be updated, that they are insufficient for today's wireless routers and should be reviewed. Thank you. Let's take, what, let's take one more for Cindy and then we'll move on. Come on up. Okay. Hi, I'm curious about when you got your bill uh, going in the uh, legislature, if you received any opposition to it initially and how you prepared to counteract that? Yes, and how did you counteract that? Yes, um, 
I don't know if it's true of all of all states, but we have the uh, Maryland Association of Bureaus uh, Boards of Education came out against it, and we also had a couple of uh, boards of education locally come out against it. The the primary concern was that we were dabbling with curriculum. And I don't know where that came from because all of our issues have really been limited to health. But they don't want us messing around in their classroom. And there is a sort of um, shadow government, if you will, among boards of education that says if it's in a classroom, it's hands off. And I think that that's shared also among the health uh, professionals. And that's if, if you're going to identify opposition, that's what it's going to be about. They're, they're pushing a digital curriculum for sure, and they don't want that digital curriculum messed with. And traditionally, nobody gets into a classroom if they aren't a teacher. So the opposition was really, don't commit to my class, don't mess with my curriculum, and don't tell my teacher what to do. Um, but as we educate more and more uh, teachers themselves, they are recognizing that they're legally responsible for a safe classroom under their duty of care. And more and more, I spoke with a media specialist today, she didn't know I was behind it, and she was raving about this legislation, thinking it was such a good idea, and I said, hey, that's my bill. So, you know, we are getting places with educators, they're beginning to understand they're professionally liable, they're legally liable, and they don't want to hurt the kids either. Cindy, thank you so much for staying up late and joining us tonight. And I really want to encourage everyone to look at Cindy's website. Again, it's www.screensandkids.us. She is a powerhouse, and she is full of information. It's a really great website. So with that, I would like to turn this microphone around, and if you have questions for our panelists, if you could kind of swing up this aisle and ask into this microphone. It doesn't like to be passed around. And then when we're over, there's Rich. I see him over there. He has his meter with him. If you want to see it, it's pretty cool. Um, and you can mingle around and sign these petitions and get your information. And um, let's start with the questions. Hi, I'm not sure who this is appropriate for, and it might just be our organizers tonight, but um, are there some already developed model guidelines or that are being, that we can start from to, as we're approaching the schools and the legislature and things like that, or are we starting from scratch on that as well? Um, well, I'll speak to that. Um, there are two initiatives in the U.S. that, are, that um, deserve mentioning. One is um, the Ashland, Massachusetts um, School District, had instituted the first best practices around Wi-Fi technology in schools, um, calling for it to only be used um, when it's in use for educational purposes, otherwise it needs to be turned off, and, and guidelines posted on the walls and so on and so forth. The, um, there are five bills right now in the Massachusetts um, legislature that, that have been submitted in different stages of development, and three of those relate to children, one relates to smart meters, but those would be good um, examples to um, look up um, what's happening in Massachusetts. Okay. They, they are the most progressive okay. of, of any place okay. in the U.S. Now in other countries, um, there's um, a lot of action that's been taking, uh, yeah, and in, on, on one of our websites, Manhattan Neighbors for Safer Telecommunications, there's a document that's called um, What Are Other Countries Doing to Protect People? And it goes through about 24 countries. And um, one of the latest is um, the uh, Cyprus has just banned um, Wi-Fi in kindergartens. They have um, um, announced that they're not going to be rolling it out in, at, into the elementary school level. France is um, probably the most progressive country in that they actually have a national bill that was passed, um, the law on sobriety, and I don't remember the rest of the name, um, but it is, um, it's calling for um, serious limitations for um, this radiation um, to children, limiting the, the radiation exposure. 
Rajasthan, India, the largest geographic area in India, has banned cell towers anywhere near schools, near on the property or nearby, and hundreds and hundreds of cell towers have been turned off. So I would really recommend, if you go through that list of what's happening in other countries, you'll see that there are all kinds of initiatives that are being um, introduced and passed and happening, and they can be very inspiring as to what, what we might do here. So um, on the graph where you had the peaks and the pulsing, and I was curious, what causes that in a system? Do you know? Well, it's the, the frequencies um, that are operating, and it's the uh, various signal characteristics that are built into the technology. So it is, um, it is simply the way that it works, um, the radiation. And, and there's also the data that's being transmitted that has some um, biological effects as well. And um, so it is ir irregular. It's a regular pulsing and peaking and a function of many different technical parameters. And it varies from uh, device to device and tower to laptop. And, but that is what is happening. There are, it is not a static um, neutral background. It is, it is constantly, it's you know, affecting the biology. So I have uh, and one more question on the um, data. How, when you mentioned the golden record here in Colorado, how can we go and see our golden record? Where is it kept, and who's the point of contact that we call? <laughs> I, I think we know the answer to that. Um, I've, I've asked the Colorado Department of Education about the golden record and they um, have referenced many times that that was an unfortunate video and an unfortunate name for it. Um, and there's no way for someone to see that. However, I do know several people that work um, in the Department of Education and they still refer to the golden record. So there you have it. Heather, can I ask one question yes, of the please. other panelists? I would like to um, ask Tracy and Victoria, um, since the addiction issue here is really so important, we're addicting people to a technology that, that's then biologically harmful, well beyond the serious addiction issues. What do you see as a solution here? Um, we have a whole generation growing up addicted to technology and um, you know, what, what do you, just any creative ideas out of the box thinking on it? That's a really big question. Um, I think awareness, that what we're doing tonight and what we're attempting to do is spread the information, get the knowledge out there, make people educated. I think um, a lot of parents have come into technology not aware of the information that we're sharing tonight, and now we can expect as younger parents emerge onto the scene and have children, they'll be more and more knowledgeable about how to uh, put parameters in place and limitations, and that's our hope. Um, but I think we're having a group of young people emerging onto the scene who are having some very serious mental health issues and addictions and academic failures and failure to launch. And it's going to take, I think, a good amount of time for the public and for uh, our government and whoever else to uh, become aware of, of the concerns and eventually uh, get more information out there to the public so they're aware of, of, of I guess, the concerns. So, yeah, I just wanted to echo the, the awareness piece. Um, I think on top of just teaching parents and educators and health professionals that there are risks, parents really need to understand why there's a risk. They need to understand kind of the science behind um, the effects, like the mechanisms and how those translate into problems. So it's easy to see when a child's totally addicted, but it's not as obvious when they're, you know, when the issues are more just attention related or they're having tantrums and, and some of these kids aren't even using screens that much and they're having problems. So I think that is really helpful, like they really need to know the reason why. Um, and I just also wanted to say regarding the other question about how to address schools, um, I do have some information on my website as well, drdunkley.com, um, D-U-N-C-K-L-E-Y.com. There's a, there's a free uh, email course on there, and there's also some information about schools. But also in the book, um, there's a whole chapter on screens in schools and 
not just about the issues, but kind of how to address schools, how to present things as a win-win situation. Um, you know, when, when asking for accommodations, whether the child has an IEP already, or if they, you know, don't have any disability whatsoever. There's, there's, you know, some ways I found that work better than other ways. Um, and there's also, like I write, for a lot of the patients I see, I actually write a doctor's note. So there's a template in there on how to ask a pediatrician or other health professional for literally, you know, asking for four weeks off of all screens, just let's just see what happens. And when you present it that way to the schools, let's do an experiment. They're a little bit more open to making changes. And I also want to mention a little bit to follow up on Cindy Eckhart's uh, information she gave about her quest in Maryland to find out how, who's regulating or giving guidelines on screen time in schools. And what she found is that there is no one doing that. We have spent this week and last week calling our own governmental agencies, school districts, Department of Education, we too have come up with the same information in Colorado, in Colorado as Cindy has found in Maryland. There's no one suggesting guidelines, creating regulations for our children. They, are, they have guidelines for chemical safety. They have guidelines for internet threats such as predatory threats, but nothing in regards to bodily harm from these devices. And they do have a responsibility to regulate and make guidelines about hazardous, hazardous devices. We can find that in the uh, regulations. But no one has thought about these screens as being a dangerous device. And I would venture to guess that after our wonderful panelists this evening, we could safely say that these have hazards and should be, there should be guidelines, there should be some sort of regulation in the schools to protect our children. So we have created a, created a petition for safe screen use guidelines in Colorado schools. Hopefully you saw it on your way in, but everywhere there's an apple on the table, there's also a petition. If you haven't signed it, it's our first step action plan that we'll be taking. You can sign up on the yellow notepad on the way out. That will give you, um, we won't share your email, but we'll give you updates on our next step action plans. Because like Cindy, we want to get safer schools for our children here in Colorado. We have some really wonderful sponsors that I want to thank personally tonight. Our platinum sponsors, one, am I going to have them up? Okay, it's okay. Clearlight Ventures. Clearlight Ventures is a social venture founded by Peter Sullivan in 2007. The company's mission is to improve human health and performance by removing widespread environmental health threats. Past projects have focused on toxic metal screening and supporting mercury policy in the United States and internationally. Current projects are focusing on EMF, electromagnetic field safety and awareness and environmental factors in autism. Peter's work on detoxification and EMFs haven't been featured in the book, Toxin Talks Out, Getting Harmful T Chemicals Out of Our Bodies and Our World. He's written several other books, and he is an executive producer for the documentary film Generation Zapped, coming out this year. Everybody look for that. It's going to be a great one. We also have Green Wave International. They're here tonight. Still, I think. Rich Lear is the... Uh, founder and chairman of Green Wave International. They provide products and tips for cleaning up dirty electricity and other healthy electropollution in homes, schools, businesses, and other settings. Their mission is helping people create healthier environments for living, learning, work, and more. Green Wave offers a meter and filters for measuring and reducing the dirty electricity present on electrical wiring in buildings. They also provide ideas for reducing personal exposure to radiation from wireless devices and technologies. If you'd like to learn more about Green Wave's work and products, please visit their website at www.greenwavefilters.com. They have a lot of really great information on their website. NACST, the National Association for Children and Safe Technology, seeks to advance policies regarding technology that protect children's health and well-being. 
The NACST Turn It Off for Kids initiative has been signed by over 30 worldwide scientists, medical doctors, and public health advocates, and calls for the removal of wireless radiation from school environments. Offering a four-step solution, the initiative toolkit includes free downloadable resources that educate parents, community, and schools on the hazards of wireless radiation exposure. AU Workshop Architects and Urbanists is a design firm based in Fort Collins where they create quality, authentic architecture with a focus on projects that sustainably invigorate neighborhoods and cities. With active architecture and master planning projects throughout the Western United States and Asia, architects Randy Shortridge and Jason Kersley founded the firm in 2013 after a combined 40 years of experience locally, nationally, and internationally. Studio Luna Press is concerned with natural wellness of people, animals, and the planet. Founder Christine Zips is an investigative journalist, independent consumer advocate, raising awareness to affect change. She strives to bring truth and information on a variety of topics that aren't shared through mainstream sources. Her current areas of focus include the so-called smart technology, Wi-Fi in schools, geoengineering, GMOs, and the FCC's rollout of 5G. If you have an interest in these topics or would like to receive notices of upcoming articles, videos, and other actions from this grassroots movement, she invites you to contact her at studio underscore Luna at comcast.net. And finally, our last platinum sponsor is MedVeg, MedVeg Fusion, a natural food and health resource. And this group's mission is to increase awareness of the many benefits of following a plant-based nutrition program, including preventing and reversing many diseases, including diabetes, high cholesterol, osteoporosis, heart disease, and many cancers. When you visit their popular Facebook page at MedVed Fusion, you will find a variety of natural health-based articles and reference links from credible sources. Founder and administration is a certified plant-based nutritionist and natural wellness advocate. And we have a few other gold, silver, and bronze sponsors. We have the National Institute for Science, Law, and Public Policy, electromagnetichealth.org, the emfsafetystore.com, Campaign for Radiation Free Schools, you can find that on Facebook, Innocence, Studio Luna Gallery, and that's it. Please, if you haven't already, there are, is a lot of information over here, um, if you could check that out. Thank you so much for coming. Thank all of you for being here. And I hope you'll follow what we're doing and continue on and help us get some safe guidelines for our children.